go forward with the intro slides, right? Uh, go ahead. Yes, it is now recording. Great. Welcome to our second interim on um, uh, the topic of versioning. And uh, if you came on a little early, you heard one of the uh, authors say we really want to move forward on the issues that are being raised here. So even though we, we don't have a huge participant list, a uh, huge amount of participants, we're going to uh, try to achieve that objective of reaching consensus in here and then bring that, bringing those, um, that consensus to the list for final agreement. Um, please do add your name to the uh, Cody MD, uh, which is how we are, um, which is our virtual blue sheet. Uh, the links for that, the easiest way to get there is probably through the link in your email box rather than trying to um, click on the slide, although I also put it in the chat. Yeah, as a point tonight, of order, we're up to 11 participants now. Yeah, awesome. Um, we are uh, an IETF meeting, which means that everything we're doing here is governed by our policies, our disclosure policies, our IPR policies. Uh, anti-harassment policies, code of contact, of conduct, all of those things. If you're not familiar with them, please take a look at the ITF note well that's on the, the link is on the bottom of the page and um, uh, read up read up to it. But uh, everything we're being is that is said here becomes part of our public record and it is being recorded and we expect that recording to be made available after this meeting. We're gonna try using the chat just for queue management, not for side discussions. Um, if you wanna have a side discussion, Jabber's the place for that. Although I have to say that uh, people are not joining Jabber in general. Right now, I'm the only one in there. Um, but that's really the place for side discussions. We'd like to try to keep the chat, uh, the, the um, media, uh, sorry, the uh, WebEx. It says media, okay, let's just say WebEx. Um, uh, chat just for that. And I know we're not always successful on that. Um, almost all the slides have been posted. There's one deck that's missing. We'll try to add that during the session. Um, the, the, uh, the deck that's missing is actually labeled here as T2, and what's shown as T2 belongs under T3. And that's been fixed already on the Code EMD. Um, the, um, the presenters are going to be managing the time here, and uh, so hopefully we'll keep things moving along. And this is sort of the, the standard um, disclaimer we've had during these uh, uh, COVID times. If you would like to have a, an interim, please just let the, the chairs know. If you'd like to have informal meetings and use the working group WebEx, um, please also let the chairs know. Although I'll also point out that we have um, other online tools that are available. If you are, are having a, um, a side meeting or informal meeting, we do ask that you send it to the working group list so that all can participate. And with that, I believe it's over to Rob. Thank you. Let me just share. These slides coming through, are they big enough? Yeah, they look good. Oh, there you go. Yeah, they look good. Okay, and I can be heard, obviously. Right, so uh, this is one of the one of the four issues I think we're going to cover today. Um, I'm hoping that this one is not very difficult or contentious. So um, I'll try and go over this fairly quickly. There's only three slides to talk about uh, and then take any questions that you might have uh, or comments on that. Um, I can't see the queue from here. Can I find a way to mitigate that? Uh, I'll, I'll solve that problem in a minute. I can't see who, any, if anyone asks questions, you may have to speak up because I can't see. So the IANA considerations, um, IANA publishes some YANG modules uh, based on registries. And so some examples of that is the IANA IF types .yang that we know that have all the different interface types. IANA uh, routing types .yang is another one and there's, and there's some more. Mostly 
when they add a, make uh, additions to those base registries uh, and the Yang registries get updated, they're backwards compatible. But there have been instances where there have been some, or at least one, uh, set of non-backwards compatible changes to the um, IANA routing types when they were modifying um, the Afi Safi families, I think. Um, so, so at least one case where there was a reason that, that the registry was being changed in a non-backwards compatible way. Um, and so the Yang module being generated by Anna was also changed in a non-backwards compatible way, so it's consistent. We believe that we should provide guidance to Anna on how to manage these uh, generated Yang modules with respect to uh, backwards compatible changes and non-backwards compatible changes and you, uh, to um, semantic versioning. The proposal here is I've added text, uh, actually hasn't been committed to the document, it will be by the next revision. The proposal is to, uh, once we've gone, gone over the, the key points here, is to ask IANA for an early review of that text to check that they're happy with it, with the proposed rules and guidance text. So as we think the documents are getting close to being complete, we can ask them for review early on, uh, before working group last call, get any issues resolved early on rather than uh, during IS, ISG review. So there's two drafts that we've um, updated the INS sections to. Uh, the first one is the Yang module versioning draft. And I haven't cut and pasted the text here. I'm not sure that's helpful. But an overview of what it's going to say is it's going to give an example of the issue where um, it was modified in a non-backwards compatible way. And that's the 20, uh, well, December, December 31st revision last year of the INA routing types Yang. It's going to make a request of IANA to follow um, versioning guidance in the uh, module versioning draft. It's going to request IANA to add rev MBC changes statement when needed. So whenever a module has been updated in a non-backwards compatible way, um, then it's going to suggest that that statement be added. And, in, and one other side effect of that is we we're proposing that whenever an existing IANA module is updated, to go back and retrospectively add any Rev MBC changes labels where required. So um, next time IANA routing types is updated, uh, it would also update and add a Rev MBC changes label to the uh, 31st of December 2020 uh, revision as well to mark that that's where an MBC change has happened. And then the last point is, and this one is more interesting, is that the plan was to provide some non-normative non example text of likely backwards compatible or uh, MBC changes updates that might happen to IANA maintained YANG modules. So obviously these documents have a full set of guidance and reference back to 7950 uh, module rules. The proposal here was to have some, just to draw out uh, common changes to um, enums or identities that would be backwards compatible and give some examples that would be non-backwards compatible. So that's the proposed in the module version draft, and that's half of the solution. And then the other half is in the Yang Semver draft, and this was going to request, uh, or in fact require that IANA adds Yang Semver versions to IANA modules um, and following the standard rules. And when updating existing modules, the proposal is to retrospectively add version labels, assuming that the initial version published by IANA, the initial revision was version 100, and then derive all other versions based on the Yang Semba rules. So most of these other ones will end up being uh, backwards compatible updates. You get 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, et cetera. In the case of the um, IANA routing types Yang, you would expect that to hit version 2.0.0 um, at, uh, for the 2020-12-31 revision, um, assuming there hasn't been any other non-backwards compatible changes. So we're going to sort of retrospectively add these even when those modules get next updated. And again, the proposal was to add some non-normative example text of likely version number changes for IANA maintained modules um, to make it easier. We will um, we'll put this extra text in, um, this, this non-normative text, and then we'll also ask IANA whether they feel that text is useful or not required, or whether they're happy just referring back to the main rules for these things. So that's all I have on the IANA. Um, topic. So um, any questions or comments on this? Let me see if I can somehow find the queue. Oops. Hi, this is Kent. Uh, Rob, did, we're just using the chat window. Um, so I put a plus queue there. Yep, I can see it now. Yeah, but as an individual, my uh, question is, so you're asking IANA to retroactively, uh, you know, 
put versions to the uh, drafts, would they be uh, in, involving the authors or the chairs or, I mean, or are they going to do it on their own? What's the guidance there? So, so this is purely for, uh, maybe should have made that clear, actually. So a lot of the YAM modules that go through the RFC editor process are ones where the authors have written those modules. And, um, and I'd expect in that case for the, uh, the authors to control the versioning. In this particular case, these modules are generated purely by Anna. By Anna. So they will, um, I think people could potentially ask for, I'll go back a couple of slides. They can ask for a new interface type to be allocated. There must be a registry for that. And whenever a new interface type is allocated, then I believe IANA IF types gets updated automatically to reflect that registry. And the same with IANA routing types, that when um, some change is made to that registry, the IANA routing types is updated automatically. So there are RFCs that make that request of IANA. So in this particular case, I don't think there's any authors involved. We could suggest that the if there's any experts associated with those, that they get, they're also asked to check those those provisions if necessary. Does that clarify? Yes, thank you. Uh, and Lou. Uh, Lou as individual. Um, does it make sense to um, put some recommendation in of when it's appropriate to have a module that's sort of self-managed by Anna when it's not? And I know that this may belong more in the guidelines to, for Yang documents, but it doesn't have it in there. I just did a quick search. Unless I missed it, I don't think it has it in there. And it, it might be worth telling people um, when to not use an IANA uh, uh, defined module um, when they're defining new ones. Um. My, my, view, my personal view is it's always been good to have the self-managed IANA modules when you're talking about um, just code points that are matching existing other um, uh, registries. But for something new, it doesn't make sense to do that. It's only if it's derivative. That's my personal view. Uh, yes, although I could, I could foresee that you, even if you didn't have the interface types, registry and assuming the one exists, I could imagine that you might just have the Yang module and have IANA own up, up, updating those. I guess in the end, it seems like actually in all those cases, you probably just say, here's the registry of values and the Yang module is always derived, I suspect. So maybe that always applies. If the IANA is managing a registry and the Yang module is derived from registry, then that's the case. Certainly we could add some text to that effect, if that's what you mean. I guess I'd have to see what text you were, you were thinking because I actually didn't follow your logic, but that's okay. If you throw some text in there, I can review it and we'll go from there rather than try to wordsmith it here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jason. But just, um, just to address the last point a little bit, like I think there's two slightly different things here and maybe uh, Lou, I think you were looking for maybe some gui general guidance on when IANA would own a Yang module and when it wouldn't. Um, I think that's useful to clarify, although I think it's a little outside the scope of our work. So maybe that's a more of a kind of a side point. Um, this is kind of more when the decision has been made that IANA is, is owning a module, then here are the guidelines for those IANA modules. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, I completely agree. It, it better belongs in, what is it, 6087, the guidelines document, but we're not going to rev the guidelines document to put in one sort of one one informational statement of uh, when you do it. It just sort of seems like it could fit here, not as a, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a hard requirement, but as just some guidance because we're, we're having text here on guidance and um, part of that could be to for IANA to understand when they should push back on, on accepting a new registry. I'm just going to turn my video off. I didn't realize I was sharing that. All that matters. You weren't doing anything embarrassing. It's fine. No, it was more Joe had commented about there being some issues with the network access or something. So I will reduce the load. But thanks for telling me. <laughs> so, it, 
have we got to a conclusion of this? I, I, I understand what Lou's point is. Um, I think it certainly has no harm for us trying to add text here, seeing if it fits okay. And if it does, that's fine. And if it doesn't, then we, we don't put it here. Are you okay, okay so, with that? Sorry. I was going to say UK of that, Jason. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, well, I guess I guess we're, it's a general question to the group here. Is, any, is anybody, I don't know if we do even do a little mini call, but is anybody opposed to giving this guidance, Diana, on, on these two points? Obviously, we'll bring it back to the working group. I have the feeling that we're kind of saying, yes, let's go ahead with this guidance and, and bring it to IANA for review and make sure they are happy with that guidance. I, I think the next step is for Rob to propose text to the working group and for the working group to comment on it. That's fine. Sounds good. Can you capture that, Jason? Are you capturing notes? Yeah, well, I was going to, but someone's doing a good job so far without me here. So. Oh, <laughs> Okay, I think, so I, I'm saying I'm done so we can move on to the next topic. All right, that's uh, Rashad with the file naming. Just share. You guys see what I'm sharing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so just a recap of this issue. This is not a new issue. We did discuss this, I think, at length at ITF 108, based on comments from I forget who. Doesn't matter regarding uh, the use of a revision label in the file name. Uh, what we had discussed is to use the uh, pound or hash sign as a delimiter when using the revision label in the file names. And we had ag agreed not to use the existing symbol as delimiter what's used because that's used for for revision date. So as shown on the second bullet, you know, we may identify young module files using either revision date or revision label. We see the same that's the same Yang module, which has two different file names here. Uh, one using the date, uh, which is the uh, current method in 7950. And then the second one using the revision label, um, which is what we're proposing here. So we went back and forth and we came back to this issue. Is that really needed? The, I mean, there's no design team anymore, but the people who meet on, on Tuesdays believe that having the revision label in file names is definitely useful for human readability, and you know it's potentially useful for tools also. Uh, one question which you know we have, and that I guess depends on various tools and various implementations, is you know what's the implication of having two copies of the same module with different file names? So if there is any bad implications, you know we'd like to hear about them here. Uh, and again, I don't see, I can't see my chat window right now. So if anybody has questions, just go and speak up, please. And this is Kent as an individual. Um, I don't know what bad implication it may have for existing tooling other than uh, suggest trying, uh, maybe with a, a number of the most popular tools like Yang, Yang Lent, um, Yang Sun. Uh, well, no, I don't think the Yang sound would be impacted. Um, but anyway, just give it a shot with a couple of those tools and see what happens. And it, ideally, they just uh, skip over the file names that have pounds in them. And, yeah, uh, that's that's a good. I tried Piangi. It was a few months back, but yes, that's a good okay. suggestion. Yeah, I, I do like the idea of the module showing up twice, or I mean, let, let's just say that each system. Um, you know, a system that's legacy and has been using uh, revision labels, it would persist the file locally using the at symbol. And then maybe new systems would be using pound symbols. Then I like the, the transition or migration strategy that it implies. Uh, but there is this question that, and, that you raise, uh, would it immediately break in existing tools? I think we need to test it. Okay. Um, Italo Busi is the first one in the queue. 
Hi, right, thank you. A question for clarification. Is it is the new schema allowing uh, uh, to, de to deliver two, two, two versions of the same module at the same date? In this mm. case, they will have the same revision date, but different revision label. Mm. No, that doesn't change. We, I mean, somebody could correct me if I've missed the memo there, but we discussed that at, a while back and we decided to keep uh, date uniqueness. So you cannot have two different revisions of the same label with the same Clear, label. clear, clear. Thank you. And uh, John Lindblad is next in the queue. Right, yeah. So I think uh, tools will eventually converge on making this work, I'm sure. But I'm a bit worried about the cognitive load. If you take a typical router or something like that with a thousand Yang modules, we'd suddenly have 2000 Yang modules. So it's, it's adding to the human operator's cognitive load trying to make sense of it. So I'm not particularly in favor of having duplicates. It's bad as it is. So, are you saying, Jan, that you want to prohibit it, or are you saying if it's optional, you would not use it? It doesn't matter so much what I use, because other people might use it, and it would be me as an operator who gets loaded with all this. But I'm, I'm not sure I want to prohibit it, or I, I would like to avoid it if possible. Okay. I don't like it. So you would rather we just stick with the date? Or would you rather say you either use one or the other? Don't care which. Yeah, either of those are at least better than, than having duplicate files, in my opinion. Okay. And, and Kent is... Uh... Right, well, Rashad may have just said it, but I was gonna say, I think it is actually one or the other, not, not duplicate. It, as I mentioned before, like legacy systems would only be using the revision dates and those systems that uh, were migrating from one to new would actually have the option, but they would only have one. Uh, there would always only be the 1,000 files, not, not never the 2,000 files. Uh, that's my understanding of what I thought Richard was uh, proposing. No, we were actually proposing, I mean, we're proposing you could use one or the other or both. Uh, right, but uh, sorry to respond. Um, when the new file is being imported into the system, the system can, you know, say hey you're not meeting my import file namings uh requirement you, you must use the file name that includes the uh, revision label not the not the versioning string um and so so that system will only ever have the files that it's able the single copy uh named the way that it's able to support that's the way i'm thinking it would be uh, handled And then Rob? Uh, yeah, I, I think I basically agree with what, with what Kent's saying here is you're allowed to have both if you really want to, if you've got some reason to, but my expectation is is that you would move to use this new scheme if you're using modules that are being revisioned using uh, semantic version numbers, for example, and that's what you'd expect to turn up in like packages, URLs and things. I don't think you would end up with two sets of these. It's just which way you label those. There is an increased cognitive node if different systems are using different approaches and you have to know that these two things are the same, actually re reference the same module. But by and large, I don't think this would be a problem. Okay, thank you. I'm going to the next slide. Okay, so then when we started talking about revision labels in file names that led on to the discussion, well, what should we allow in revision labels? We, you know, obviously we, you know, the two delimiters we're talking about in file names uh, should should be avoided. Maybe that should be a must, I don't know. Uh, we discuss in weekly meetings whether we should allow different character sets and all that. And for now we're saying that we don't believe that's needed. Um, there's two main options which we discuss. One is either be very restrictive, start restrictive with a small set of what we allow, or you know by default we're permissive and we disallow some specific ones. Uh, other stuff we discussed: uh, do we allow a comma? Well, you know we went back and forth on that, and 
think it was an example which was given where it's used, I forget in what system, uh, for precedence. Uh, we definitely agreed on disallowing the semicolon. So I would like to hear uh, people's thoughts on this. What should we allow? What should we disallow in revision labels? Uh, Balash is in the queue. Uh, short uh, opinion. I think better be restrictive and see if we really need other things. Yeah, I think that's how we started, I think. Uh, Especially if this becomes part of the file name, being very open might be dangerous. Yes. Uh, and then Kent. Right. Uh, just to follow on to what Blush says, I certainly I wouldn't um, introduce any other characters that are not already allowed in file names um, as, as currently defined by 7950. Yes. The module name is fairly restrictive from what what I recall. So I guess like I mean, like everything else, we just ship this back to the list and make sure, you know, if anybody objects to whatever we're proposing. So right now, I think the authors and the people here are saying more restrictive is fine. Um, I was just going to, yeah, just going to jump in actually. So just to go back to Kent, the one extra character at least that we are adding, if you look at two A, is definitely the plus character, and I think the comma also are characters that we will be adding beyond what's specified for a Yang identifier. And I think there's definitely cases where plus would turn up in versioning schemes, and the, and the comma has been used in at least one versions versioning scheme. So that's why that was on the list. Um, but in the design team meetings, there was at least one person who was concerned about introducing comma uh, and making adding complexity in terms of like CSV. Um, mm. um, okay, well, I think uh, when you send the message to the list, you can claim that it's introducing no new characters except for plus and comma, and of course the pound symbol, and and at least call out the new characters that are being uh, suggested. Yep, good point. And this is the last slide. Okay, so I guess next. Next is Balash. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rashad. Okay, then let me try sharing. Oops, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So one maybe partly new idea we came up for with is that uh, we have these backwards compatibility rules and they might be a bit too simple. So RFC, the Yang RFC defines allowed and not allowed changes, but now that we are allowing, at least here in our presentation, we'll move to the backwards compatible, non-backwards compatible terminology. And our next uh, print or basic statement is that the design rules for config false and co uh, for config true data should be different. Because uh, just some examples where it is trivial. So if you add a mandatory leaf to a config true part, that's uh, NBC. But if you add something extra that comes back from the node, yeah, you can just ignore it and it works. So we propose to add a separate compatibility rules for config false data that are partly different from what we have today in 7950. There are some principles behind this. 
first of all, a network server is not uh, mandated to check the out outgoing data according to the models. If I remember correctly, 7950, the, the constraint checking is only described for incoming data. Also, there is not just the config false data, but output uh, section of notifications and actions and RPCs are the same. So they are, yeah, any data that comes from the node or most of it is very similar. And then we want to put really some requirements on clients. Most basic, they should be able to survive whatever comes out of the node or whatever does not come from the node. And then some simple things like this, discarding elements, attributes, properties should be trivial. On the other hand, a well-designed client uh, should be able to do more than this. So if part of the day, let's say a big chunk of data is valid, it should be able to use it even if the other is discarded. Uh, value space extensions should be tolerated to some level. Also, the too many list or leaf, uh, leaf list items should be tolerated. Just discard the rest. So we came up with some basic rules. One is that adding ad, uh, mandatory and optional data nodes, and these are rules strictly for config false data. So. Uh, just those just those ones so adding anything extra that's okay basically if the client can discard anything that comes out and the consequence if that you make something optional or into mandatory yep that's just a bit of extra data if the client doesn't care discard it more controversial is removal of optional data one thought uh, about this was that it's optional. So the client never promised you, he, it, or sorry, the server never promised it will send anything. So you should not be surprised if it doesn't. Others said that, yeah, we don't always use the mandatory marking and min elements marking so strictly in state data or in config force data. So this is dangerous. Similarly, uh, okay, the next one is removal of mandatory data. Yes, the client should survive it without crashing, but if it expects mandatory uh, state data, then yeah, that's that's non-backwards compatible. And uh, the, as a consequence, changing a mandatory data into optional, that's the same thing as potentially removing mandatory data. Value space. Now, it's a bit of a reverse compared to configuration. So if it is decreased, yeah, then that should be perfectly acceptable. No one said that we'll use every value of it all the time. On the other hand, expanding the value space, it should be tolerated. It's strictly speaking, this can cause problems to a client. If let's say it stores the integers on a byte because they believe it never will go over it, but I think we should be more liberal in this case, otherwise all the changes will become uh, NBC. Reducing the value space is just fine. Also min and max elements, uh, they would be fine, except there is one case we thought it's not okay to do. If you change min elements to lower, lower value, so if you had the min elements equals one and you change it to zero, that's the same thing like removing, and we said that's already, that it's non backward compatible. And then um, after yeah, this, we no get into a lot of detailed rules, but once we can agree on this, then yeah, then we'll be yeah. happy to work. Uh, Jason, go ahead. Um, so the the really tricky one for me is, um, is the second bullet, and that is removal optional data. So. The example we came up with in our discussions is, um, you know, say say you take some interfaces module that has some statistics per interface, like received bytes, uh, received packets. That second bullet would say that you could remove all those counters from the model, republish it, and say it's backwards compatible. And I guess that's the one that I was struggling with a little bit, that a user of a module 
that suddenly has no more interface stats might be a little su be surprised by considering that a backwards compatible change. Um, so I don't know what other people think there, but it's hard to reconcile that one then with, with the second last bullet, which I do agree with, which is say you had interface state variable, uh, a status, interface status that had, you know, up, down, and some other intermediate status values. And if a model just decided to remove some of those intermediate values from the enum list, and now the model only reports up, down, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that's as much impact to a client. So it'll just never receive those other status values. But somehow that second bullet from the top feels wrong um, to, to call backwards compatible. Other people thought that if you really want it all the time, indicate it with a mandatory. Others said that that's not common practice. Um, can't. I'm just uh, replying to that last comment. I, I'm thinking, uh, Jason, if if a if a vendor were to drop all the statistics, that would probably be um, not appreciated by the market, and they would lose. Um, you know, market I, people would. Be, I, I don't. I don't think they would. I mean, theoretically, yes, but in practice, I'm not sure if it would happen. I went kind of extreme, but even removing a leaf that a model used to support, I guess I'm struggling with whether that should be considered backwards compatible. Even though it's just, in a way, it's just reducing the value space of the state part of the model. So, our, I mean, our general spirit here is that when you just suddenly stop returning something in a state model, that's, or, I mean, it's a bit different. If you suddenly start having those items in the model, you know, a, an old client is working with the old model, that's fine. He just won't receive those leafs. But I'm still struggling with how intuitive that's going to feel to people that when you, you know, you remove an octet counter from your model or remove some other piece of state that somehow that's still considered backwards compatible. And just to quickly add on to uh, respond to that, um, I would hope that they would go through a deprecation policy. So they'd first deprecate it and then subsequently um, obsolete it and remove it. They could, but they don't have to because it's considered fully backwards compatible. So I know. Like but again, managing expectations. So if you were a good vendor and that's, you know, you would do that. Or you or you could just not send it because, yeah, it's optional. So I don't even have to modify my model, just stop sending it. And is that better? I don't think that's better. If the vendor uh, truly doesn't publish the link anymore, they should, you yeah. know, no I, I fully agree. That's why I think that the proper thing to do is use the mandatory marking even on uh, state data if, if you want to know what's happening. This, it is mostly mandatory, but but I still didn't mark it. Lou. Um, when you say um, uh, um, sorry, we'll try to find the comment. The removal reducing the value space, is that on an uh, on optional data or on mandatory data? Both. Okay. I think we have to split that out as well. Why? Because I think if you're removing the, if you're reducing the value space on mandatory data, that's a non-backward compatible change. From a user standpoint, I may have some sort of automation system that relies on that mandatory data and relies on that value space. And as a vendor, you're not going to know that. And you give me a model that's supposed to be Docker compatible and you break my automation system. And yet you're going to claim that you're conformant. So if it's mandated, I, I think we have to follow the same rule on value space as we do for mandatory and optional data. Whatever those rules are, and I, I do think I, I, I do agree that there's arguments on both sides. I, but for mandatory data, I, I don't think you can change the value space without it being backward compatible. I may have said that backwards, but I think you know what I mean. I think I, I'm afraid we are just encouraging people to, yeah, not declare that they don't use those values. 
that's yeah. Yep. If you, if you yeah, are up, it, down, I mean, and it, middle. It, if it, the data is mandatory, it's mandatory. No, no, no. What I'm saying, you have a mandatory state that goes up, down, and changing. And yeah. then you decide that I don't like this changing state. So you just stop using that specific value. You have yeah, the same I, model. I, I, I've built an expensive automation system that's relying on that changing state. When I see it, I do a whole bunch of things. And you're, you know, the equipment's been tailored to the, the equipment and it's been working great. And now this new version that's not flagged is non backward compatible. You know, I tell my vendor, I'm only going to take backward compatible models. They say, sure, this is backward compatible. And all of a sudden, my very expensive automation system breaks. It's a question of how strict we want to be. Right. And I remember so Mark. I, 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 I'm voicing just... a personal opinion on the value space on mandatory data. Um, Rob. Um, yes, I, I actually agree with, with, I wasn't going to talk mainly about Lou saying, but I agree with what he's saying. It seems reasonable to me what he's suggesting here that splitting mandatory and non-mandatory makes sense. Uh, I do think for the second one, the optional data, I also see that as being an empty change. And I think that where I'm coming from is that I don't think that a lot of the models that I see, they mark everything as mandatory for the config false space, whereas often that's probably what they mean. And actually, the, the idea is that if it's not marked as mandatory, then generally, if the value is um, appropriate, it should be returned. And if a, if a device is not going to return that value at all, it should be used a deviation to say, I don't, I'm not going to return this piece of data at all. So the deviation should be used. So in that sense, I think that it's dangerous to allow this optional data to be just removed from a model. Uh, I think that that's likely to impact um, clients. And I think it's because we don't use mandatory in quite the same way for, for config false data. I fear you are removing the mandatory uh, statement from, from state data practically because you say, yeah, we don't, no one at care really does it correctly. So make, let's make everything mandatory. But to, to give an example, you could have a counter on the Ethernet interface, which splits them out between unicast, multicast and broadcast packets. And that makes sense for those Ethernet interfaces. You'd expect it always to be returned. But if you had another interface, a, a sonnet interface or something, then you wouldn't have that split out. So you can't really make it mandatory because it doesn't make sense in some cases. But for all those interfaces, you would expect it always to be returned, or if the system doesn't support it, to deviate it away. But then the correct thing is to do, say, when interface type is Ethernet, or when interface type is Sonnet. But that has problems as well. In the sense, if you come along and create a new interface type, or it's a vendor interface type, then, then you can't use those default counters. Um, Jason. Uh, I think that was my previous one. So go ahead on to NetConf working group or again. Yeah, to Kent. Okay, yeah, two uh, responses. I guess first to Lou's comment, uh, the removal of mandatory data, I think there's a difference between the leaf, removing the leaf, which was marked as mandatory true, and then if the leaf was type enumeration, uh, you know, the enumerated values where they marked mandatory or not. And um, but to others' points, uh, historically, we've been very lax, probably, in uh, the marking of uh, state data and especially enumerations, as to enumerated values, as to if they are mandatory or not. This may go into the um, IANA guidance or, you know, as we're transitioning and we're asking folks, um, it may be that, you know, would we, 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 I mean, first, perhaps MetConf should put guidance that state data should be declaring explicitly the you know mandatory for config false um and then secondly as we're going through this transition we may need to retroactively uh, mark things appropriately uh so that um, the expectations can be managed going forward and then lastly uh in a slightly different point but it goes to the fourth sub bullet point here expanding the value space uh, i think this also needs to take into account patterns so if you have a string and it has a pattern um on it and but then you want to expand the value space of that pattern so now it's more permissive than before i'm not so sure if that would actually be backwards compatible in all cases so something to consider 
I think we should consider there are a number of things, ranges, lengths, patterns, theoretically even a must, but it's very hard to evaluate if when, when a must is more or less restrictive. But yes, we completely agree. Uh, and Jan is next in the queue. Thank you. So I think I'm very much with Balash here. If you read a Yang model and it's not giving you any guarantees, we shouldn't be reading in additional thoughts about what the author had intended with something. So, I mean, backwards compatibility is not only about uh, optional or mandatory. It's not only about when expressions. It's also about what the description statement says. So if you are suddenly removing some intermediate interface state that's no longer existing or something, then you supposedly would write about that in the description statement, and that wouldn't be backwards compatible, perhaps. We can just assume that, uh, I mean, if, if there's nothing written in the description, there's nothing in when, nothing mandatory, why should we expect that it's that the device would actually return this optional leaf? But if there is something in the description, we can trust that, and that might be a backwards comp incompatible change if we change the statement. We should trust the Yang. And Rob, uh, sorry, Jason. Can I, yeah. can I just okay? Go ahead, Rob. Can, can I just jump in and respond to Jan? But but if a device is never going to return a leaf, is it not correct that it should deviate that statement away and say I'm, I don't support this leaf and never return it? So I'm going to use a deviation. If the description statement doesn't say anything about this leaf, then I don't think so. But if the description statement says this will return the number of bytes sent on the interface, blah blah, and it doesn't do that, then of course it's breaking the description statement and it's, they should deviate. And it, if it returns it in 1% of the cases? If it returns it 1% of the cases, then you don't deviate the leaf and you return it sometimes and don't return it other times. You, you return it all the times it makes sense. Um, I'm just saying that you, if it's just 1% of the cases, you probably already can't rely on it. So, and then is it 20%, 50%, 100%? But, uh, but I also wonder, though, if, if vendors implement these YAM models and, and then, then the operators ask, well, where are all the counters? You said, well, they're, they're not marked as mandatory, so we've decided not to bother returning them to you. I suspect that that wouldn't go down well. That may well be the case. But, I mean, what, what sort of rule should we have in the YAM definition to say, no, you can't do that because it, it's, if you should read between the lines, it's not going to be solid. So let's trust the Yang models more and make sure that they are correct instead. Right, I, so my, my points are all around the exact same discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more in line with Rob on this. I, I think the common expectation in these models is that um, it's like, I don't, I don't think we should be mark. I don't think we should be transitioning to this, um, a situation where we try to mark all sorts of state leaves in our models as mandatory. I think there's a lot of behavior around state that is um, too difficult to describe in the model. I think describing the existence of counters in the model and what format you could expect for the counter, but things like interface stats, some of the counters are applicable to some types, some aren't, some may be applicable in some situations that aren't really describable. I, I think, and you know, clients, the things with the state, the state variable, Clients, I, I think clients need to be designed around the fact that they generally, they can't count on a state variable being returned, but when it's returned, they need to know how to handle it. And if it's returned, that's what the model tells them what to do. Yeah, so, so I think we are, we are much in agreement here. Uh, if, the, if you have a case that's undescribable, you can never know, you cannot really tell from the outside if it's gonna be returned or not. If you stop returning it in that case, nobody will be able to tell the difference. So that's backwards compatible. But if you do have a description statement, this is going to be re de delivered for all the interfaces uh, under certain conditions. And as long as those conditions are met, it would be backwards compatible not to return it. So then you have to look at the description statement to determine if something, if a change is backwards compatible, dropping this le optional leaf is backwards compatible or not. You mean it would be NBC, I think you meant, yeah, um, like if the description says this is, this is usually returned and you don't... The, I, I mean, there's two things here we got to be careful about, guys. There's what's in the model, and then there's what a server does. So, 
those are two slightly different things. And what, what we're trying to decide here is what do we, what do we mark in a change to the model? How a server behaves, I think maybe a slightly different thing, like a little bit more, like some people mentioned, like let the market decide if an implementation does a good job of returning all the counters or whatever, or it properly describes a deviation when it doesn't, I, I think maybe that's a slightly different issue than what should the model, what's the model for and what is a backwards compatible change in the model itself? I, my, my gut is that the, a backwards compatible change is more about um, if a leaf is returned, can the old server with the old model still interpret that leaf properly? I still feel you are trying to introduce a completely new definition of mandatory and optional for state data compared to what we had until now. Yep. Yeah, just, uh, I, I'm somehow really uncomfortable with us saying we're going to go mark all sorts of state as mandatory now. Just I'm, I mean, it, mandatory when that means you like every time you query state, you have to return that thing. At this point, yes, that's what's written in the standard. So, so my concern is Rob here. My concern is that if we do this, it just means we've got to update all these models and add a man mandatory true statement to pretty much all config false nodes, because I think they're all probably effectively mandatory by default. So right. you can change you could change the language, not in Yang one one to say if we were to go down the path to say mandatory is, is the default, mandatory true is the default for config false nodes unless you turn it to be mandatory false. But it seems to be if we require people just to add, to add the word mandatory to all config false nodes, it's just going to be noise. It doesn't actually really help. I think the default behavior, I, I think, for config false nodes is that a device should be returning them, but it doesn't deviate them, or, or if they don't make sense. That's definitely not how we use mandatory in, in, in I think in 3GPP and in Ericsson. Yeah, I, so, so Balash, how, how is it used? Because I mean, so we my... try to mark everything when, uh, mandatory and that if, if you have a guarantee that it's returned. But I think that's very unusual in the industry from, from my experience. I don't see mandatory in much state out there at all. I'm not sure if other people are, I mean, I haven't done the research, but from my memory of cruising around state models and open config and ours and ITF models, I, that's a pretty rare thing, I think, to see state marked mandatory. I guess, I'm not so much arguing what mandatory maybe should mean for state. Um, I think mandatory true probably should mean the same thing as config. Well, it should mean that the it's guaranteed to be returned. Um, I think what I'm arguing a little bit more is I'm not sure that should be widespreadly, that should be used much at all in many models because I think too many of them will have, even if they have 1% of the cases or 5% of the cases where it, it really is allowed to be suppressed because it's not applicable, well, then you can't mark it mandatory. Mandatory, you have to be really certain that you're only conformant to that model if you are returning that thing, any query, no matter what. In the old, in RFC and in the original uh, Yang design, we had this principle, oh, sorry, that data coming from the NetConf server is, is a kind of a best effort. And if you look at uh, 7950, there is no, this, chapter describing how to check outgoing data. There's only a chapter for incoming data. So, yeah, it, it's always in a way best effort. I can't. All right. Uh, I, yeah, I agree. I think historically it's been best effort, but I also think that's probably not in the interest of interoperability. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to enable clients to be interoperable with an upgraded server. And you know, the focus has been, you know, on the being able to push 
configuration and you know whether or not that semantics of the prior configuration is still understood by the server but also it's the values that come out of the server and you know if this client is not if its legacy understanding is no longer valid then you know however it's done whether it be in a description statement or not it's still breaking the expectations and i do think it's probably um a, a problem that we have not been good uh, in setting the mandatory values um, on the state data. Like, so we have, and to Rob's point, I, thought, I don't think we can just um, modify, you know, say it's like default mandatory true, so you only have to, you know, flag it when mandatory false, that that would actually be breaking existing semantics. We'd have to have Yang next in order to introduce that kind of change. Um, but I don't see the issue. I mean, you, you spoke to it being noise. Um, so what? Noise to a, a computer, it doesn't really matter if they can process it fine. I mean, if you humans are reading the module, maybe it's a little bit more busy looking, but I don't necessarily see that as a reason for not to do it relative to uh, the issue that we're facing. So as I see it, we have one principle or a question. So how strict do we want to be? with the, uh, allowing things to be changed, like removal of optional data and reducing value space. And there are two thoughts. One is that mandatory means mandatory, optional means optional. That's one way. And, and it, they, that is a good thing in Yang that we really say what we mean. Or we can say that in practice, people are not using mandatory properly. So let's be careful and mark these things and we see. Which one we choose? Yeah, I can live with both of them, but. Yep, and Rob? Just, uh, just a slightly different point, and that's also to think about where we're coming from today with the rules in RFC 7950. The effectively, they would disallow you from removing optional, uh, a config false node. They would still require that to be deprecated and obsoleted. So it feels to me going from a stage where that's entirely banned or has to have this migrated deprecation and obsolution to a point where actually it's fine to remove that as a BCD change. It seems like a, a big leap to go from, from where it was to where it is now. And maybe that's why there's not been the need to mark all these things as mandatory today is because actually you, you can't just remove these things. You can choose not to return them. Um, I would say in those cases you should deviate them if you're not going to return them, but you have that choice. But removing it from the model today is still uh, not allowed without deprecating it first. Mm, no, it's not allowed at all today to remove something. Well, you, you could deprecate and then obsolete, which is sort of equivalent. Well, so. Probably if we want to go forward, uh, NBC for this second and part of the, the one, two, three, four, fifth case is more cautious. Yeah, I don't like it, but it's probably, it's easier to get it. Well, yeah, if we, if we want to be form, formal and describe like, I, I, I guess if we want kind of um, clear rules with the same meaning as config, we can do that. That means we would have to split all this by optional and mandatory. Um, then I think I think there'd be a second interesting discussion of um, how much you should use those strict markings. Like, I don't. Yeah, I. Like, what would an implementation implementation do? So, say we're strict and we marked uh, the IF module and mark all those counters as mandatory. The all the different error counters, the so so like the, from the IF mid, there's a bunch of different error counters, right? Some of them are related to um, there's like disc out discards, out errors, etc. So we mark all that as mandatory, uh, and then and then an implementation has some corner cases where they sometimes don't return those for certain types of interfaces. W what would they do? Would they, they're not going to deviate those leafs because they return them for some, but they're going to break the contract for some interfaces. Uh, 
I, I don't think I don't think a client should rely on all those IF counters. So I I would I would not even if we want a strict language here I wouldn't I'm not sure we should mark those counters as mandatory. I think the market market can decide whether an implementer has done a good job if they do and don't provide those counters. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, as an individual, and by, as with all my previous comments, um, to Jason's point, I, th I think we're currently in a um, a vague definition of you know seven nine fifty in the way it's been defined and. Uh, perhaps this is not a solvable problem with 7950. We we need to wait for Yang next to um, you know put new rules that are more uh, strict or deterministic, let's say, and and then only the Yang next specific modules can have those guarantees that we that that we want slash the market needs um, in order to 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 address this issue fully. So we, we may actually be in a, in a, in a gray area now. Uh, we just need to do the best we can. Uh, sorry, I think we are in a black area already because let's say uh, adding a optional or mandatory node, that's forbidden in 7950. But we seem to agree that that's perfectly okay with state data. So this strictly speaking goes against 7950. So, I, I mean, I mean, at least I mentioned before breaking the client's uh, expectations of the contract. It, so for, uh, I mean, my client runs anything it receives from the server through a validator, a Yang validator, right? So, so my litmus test is, will that validation fail? Even for state? Sure. Of course. And and Kent, could you just ask what what happens if that validation does fail? What does your client do with the data? Well, <laughs> so actually, the, the, I mean, there's, but there's a prior uh, statement to that, which is when my client first investigate or uh, interrogates the um, Yang library to see what version of the module is being used and if it's compatible with it. So where, I mean, it would presumably be, I mean, as of today, we don't yet have this NBC um, uh, structure, you know, in place just yet. So, Mike, there's no code yet written to handle that case. But for example, yeah. if you get a one extra XML element, will you discard it silently? And work on happily, or will you say, "Okay, this two megabytes I received that is nonsense. Throw it out." It would probably be the latter, I guess. I mean, I know that's not a good answer, but I mean, we'd have to. It's very much probably case by case. It, it, we're talking about an RPC reply in this particular conversation, but I'm actually more worried about notifications, especially when we start talking about configured um, subscriptions, where so you know, it's one thing for dynamic subscriptions the client you know connects and then has the potential to look at yang library to figure out if it's compatible but it's a different thing with configured subscriptions because then the publisher could just start send it could be updated to a new revision and just start sending uh potentially newly defined uh information to a receiver that has no um a clue as to you know that information that's coming and and how would it handle that scenario i don't know Again, I would think that the receiver would run the notifications through a validator, but it, that's, it's going to fail, right? If it's not backwards compatible. Depending on what do you do with the data, if you just show that there is a leaf there, then yeah, who cares about compatibility? If you want some sophisticated algorithm on it, Hey, hey guys, just from a time check, we're gonna uh, we'll, we'll go about five more minutes on this topic. Then we want to just make sure we leave a few minutes for the fourth one. So uh, let's go for another five minutes. But we should come up with a kind of next steps on this topic over the next few minutes. I would propose to 
accept that uh, two and partly for I is NBC because we have too many open issues, even if I don't don't agree with it. Let's move forward. And I I would very much like what Ken said that a, a statement that yes we should uh, be more careful with uh, state markings in, in uh, or in mandatory markings with state data. I didn't uh, sorry I didn't follow your first point, but last you said so I the think second bullet you wanted NBC and yes as as others wanted. Oh, sorry. So basically, I, because it's just because it's easier to get it accepted, and we need, we yeah. have too many open issues. Yeah. So you're basically accepting slide four as written. Sorry. You're basically accepting slide four as written. Then. No second bullet. No, no, no. I think he wants to second, change. I want to change removal of optional data is NBC and. Got but, it. Uh, he also said that reducing value space uh, yeah. for mandatory yeah. items is also NBC. It's rendered target blind by red. <laughs> so, got it. Um, uh, it's Rob here. Uh, actually, just to clarify again, that all my comments so far have been as, as a contributor and the same here. Um, so, actually, I think that. That Kent was probably on the money here, where where he says actually solving this properly is potentially an issue to be pushed off to Yang.next. I I think that is the right answer, but I also believe in the interim uh, for the moment that having two as being NBC is is the right choice from where we are today. Uh, it may not be the right choice in future, and the reducing the value space for mandatory again. I think that that's probably. Um, it seems reasonable for that to be NBC with where we are today and how often mandatory has been used today. But I, I do agree that it's it's not easy to solve this generically unless we change Yang in some way or clarify it. Okay, so Balash, I guess um, maybe you can bring that to the list and we'll uh, move on to our last topic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I just add one more thing uh, to that con to discussion? Um, the the business about the client validating the RPC reply and potentially failing uh, if it doesn't um, match if it doesn't validate could be seen as an a de developer aid uh, of the server that you know the developers are actually using the client's ability to validate the responses to catch potential issues that you know they they didn't they they do mean to implement the spec to standard they just didn't realize and so i don't know just something i mean i guess we could claim that unit tests uh should be developed it doesn't have to be the actual production client it could be a test harness that does it but um okay i'll stop there just it's rob here just one quick response to kent um it's also probably worth checking the nmda spec because that has that certainly allows a server to and break those constraints, at least temporarily, um, as the data is being resolved. So if the clients are strictly validating it, then um, then they'll have issues, I think. So I think it's fine to validate it and flag up warnings or errors or things like that. I think um, refusing to accept the data because you've got a validation error, I think that that could be a problem in the general case. It might be in some specific cases, it's okay. Just yeah, my thoughts. That's only for operational config through that might happen. Uh, I think it'd be true for config false as well. So you might have something where you've configured uh, a leaf in configuration and that's getting applied through the system. And then there's other things being updated on the back of that. And an NDA is saying that you can't assume that the view of data you see from operational is always going to be cons self consistent across the whole thing. You know, if you're getting different views of the fibs from the different line cards, you're not going to guarantee that when you read them, they will always be in sync. They might be, might be out of step. Okay, <laughs> I'm sure we're all kind of uh, chomping at the bit to continue this discussion. There's still more discussion to be had on this, but um, 
let's uh, let's move on to the last topic just to we make sure we have a few minutes for it as well. Thanks, Blash. Mm -hmm. Go Rashad. Oh no, it's Joe. My apologies. It's Joe for the last one. Yeah. Um, hopefully, well, I don't know how controversial or not this is going to be let me bring up the <clears throat> chat window uh, not that the queue has been it's been mostly just discussion at this point so um this issue is uh affectionately called github issue number 61 on um uh yang simver version gaps um, but it also covers a um uh, a related issue, and that is stripping of history or stripping of uh, revisions from um, uh, Yang modules. So the, the way the issue is stated is in a question, can there be gaps in the semantic version history? Um, initially, the, the comments in the GitHub issue were, yeah, sure, of course you can do that. Um, and then the follow-up was, well, if you allow that, then in the case of import revision or derived, um, and you had a lineage that went like this, 1.0, 1.1, 1.3, what would happen if someone imported your module at uh, 1.2 revision or derived? Um, since the revision label of 1.2 isn't tied to anything, there's no revision that, that has that label, um, what would happen? Um, and uh, I, I postulate that the same thing could happen if you uh, did an import by specific revision and you imported by a date uh, that didn't exist for that module. Um, the side issue or related issue is, can one strip revisions uh, from a module? And I realize bullet four should have probably said stripping revisions, not versions, but um, one might want to strip revisions from a module. As a module keeps iterating and, and changing and changing and changing, you build a lot of uh, space, uh, even though text compresses pretty well and it, it, it's not a lot of space. You, you build a lot of header uh, into a module. So one might consider, yeah, I, I, I want to uh, strip off some of these older revisions. Um, but if you, if you do that, uh, you run in the risk of not being able to resolve those revision or derived imports. Um, and if you happen to strip off a revision that contained an NBC uh, tag or NBC extension, um, then you lose that visibility to what was uh, an in, what revision introduced a, a non-backwards compatible change. So the author's proposal uh, is as follows. Sorry, Joe. Joe, sorry. Oh, yep, sorry. Uh, and um, I had my hand up or whatever on the pre pre previous slide. Um, okay, so, so I don't understand the motivation for what. Why would you want to strip the any the, any at all? And and secondly, how is it possible that one dot two wouldn't be present? Um, okay, so the the uh, why might you want to strip the the thoughts on of the authors were um, and and it could be really any reason, but one of the reasons was a large amount of revision. It it's from a human standpoint, it, cumbersome to read, it takes up space. Um, th those are really some of the things that were discussed. It doesn't, as you'll see when we get to the proposal. Um, we're, we're not saying that you would want to do this, uh, but those were some of the things we, we came up with as we were discussing the, the possibilities here. Um, Balash? It's on for the moment. Um, and then as for why you might have 1.2 missing, um, again, we were asking the question, would you allow for uh, revision gaps? Maybe... Um, I don't know, 1.2 was an internally released uh, revision that just never uh, had the light of day, but uh, internally you, you, you didn't want to confuse your uh, tooling, so you released a, a 1.3, and 1.3 became the publicly released module, uh, the publicly released uh, revision of the module with that module uh, ver uh, version la revision label. Okay, just as a quick response to that, or to where we're at right now, um, I don't believe that we should worry about the human problem, and I don't think we should allow gaps. But okay, let's continue, and we'll see how where this goes. So, so our stance was that you would allow it should you have a need, like I said, from in that 
uh, perhaps uh, internal um, usage of a, a revision label and you thought, okay, we're going to have a 1.2. Oh, we can't release that, so we'll come up with a, a 1.3 instead so that externally no one ever sees a, a consumer, a customer uh, would never see a 1.2. Um, and therefore, if you do allow gaps, one can only import by revision or derived from an existing simver, meaning if you have a lineage in a, a given uh, module, uh, you have all of those, you can see my hands, but you have all of those revisions working backwards, um, the tooling would look to see, oh, can I resolve 1.2? It would look up the list of revisions, um, and if it can't find it there, it fails to import, just like importing from if you specified an incorrect or a date that didn't exist, a revision date that didn't exist, you wouldn't be able to resolve that import either. Um, so that's uh, proposal one with respect to gaps in Simver. Uh, so Kent, I assume you'll want to, or maybe Balash, you're in queue for this first. There's one more important reason for gaps. If you imagine branching, you go 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and then you realize that I need a additional something on 1.2, or let's say on 1.0 additional function, so it must be 1.5. Then when I develop 1.4 in the main branch further, 1.5 is already used. I have to skip to 1.6. And then it looks like that on the main branch that 1.5 is a gap. And also failed projects are very common. <laughs> so yeah, we need that. Okay, just a couple quick responses to that. Um, the first to Blage's point, I don't know. I mean, so that sounds like an internal merging uh, issue. Uh, I don't know. But I mean, I, perhaps it does happen, but and maybe this leads into my first comment also to jo Joe's um, thing, which is, uh, I mean, it's all about managing expectations. And in, in I mean, with revision dates, of it never, mat never mattered, but we're introducing now revision numbers and I mean, I don't know of any library that skips, right? I mean, if it, if it goes, you know, if there's a sequential sequence, of, if there's a sequence of numbers, there's always every, uh, you know, value within the sequence, uh, you know, and and if a value is missing, then immediately people say, well, where is it? Like, why isn't why isn't it present? Like the the expectation is there, and so anything that's against the expectation, you know, is going to flag confusion and whatnot so that's this is what i'm trying to avoid well so so let me let me uh, on that well actually jason's well, jason and rob um i i probably should go in order uh, instead of just jumping in so jason um well uh, joe i mean if you want to get go back to kent go ahead and then i'll come in although i'm also um uh, going to respond but since you're the slide leader you, you go ahead and respond then i'll, I'll go Okay, so I, I, I take a, a, a kind of example of, of some of the way GNU does, does um, dev, dev versions versus FCS versions. And if you, if you take that to an extreme and you say that every odd um, uh, minor revision or minor version is internal only, just dev, um, and we're going to release on the even versions, then externally you would have 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, um, and that would, to your point, can't be expected, but it would also be a gap from a sequential numbering standpoint. Okay. Yeah. Good point there. Yeah. And I guess along those lines, I think, I think, um, there will be reasons why, you know, some people may want to, um, have internal versions that aren't published and it's really super valuable, I think to have consistency in those numbers like i wouldn't i wouldn't want an internal um i'm thinking probably more on the vendor side you know if we had some internal versions i would hate to have to have a mapping that that because we're forced to have our external versions contiguous when we had a bunch of internal versions it would be really painful to have that so i guess it's not so much that we're going to really recommend skipping numbers it's more that we allow it and yeah. we thought it would be okay because our algorithm to find if something is allowed to be imported is purely this. You can't assume that the number four comes after the number three. You just search through the history, period. Because you can have, I mean, we talk about Semver, but we also allow, we could allow a label, revision label scheme that is random words. 
I got my Star Wars revision. I got my Pluto revision. I got my Foo revision. And the relationship between those and what order they come in is completely unknown. You know, you just search through the history. And if you find it, you know the module you're looking at is a, is a descendant. Okay. I, I'm, I'm okay with uh, the reason for why there might be gaps, I guess. Uh, it's still kind of a question mark, but maybe it then underscores the necessity for their for the for not stripping any items out of the revision history and 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 in fact we'll we'll get to that in the next slide but rob you're also in queue i i actually have a bit more sympathy for what kent's point is here i, I just a couple of comments here is i don't think the vendor should ever be required to publish all versions or all, all revisions i don't think that makes sense but it is plausible that in the revision history if you went from 1.1 to 1.2 as an internal version, then 1.3 is, is what you want to publish. You publish version 1.3, you still keep a, an entry in the revision history for 1.2, and maybe you update the description just to say an internal version. So in terms of what's published, you only publish 1.1 and 1.3, but in terms of looking at the history in 1.3, you can see that 1.2 existed somewhere. It's just not available to see what the contents of that file was. Yeah, except you had 18 versions in the middle. That's going to bloat that history terribly. Yes. Uh, yep, yeah, that would be a downside. And and the other thing here is we've saying gaps in some of the revision labels are allowed, and I don't I don't disagree with that. I wonder whether we should strengthen that to say allowed but not recommended, maybe. Um, but maybe that's too strong. Uh, sure, I I. I... I would say the same thing that that Jason said about bloat and and also the the ar arbitrariness. I mean, we're we're treating these as numbers, but they could be well for some ver they are, um, they could be something else. But um, I, I'm okay actually softening some of that. Um, to to we I thought allowed was fairly um, permit uh, or, or fairly you know we weren't saying you should or you. you you, it's more you may have have gaps in in this, um, and, and maybe there's something to say. Uh, keeping some lineage there is is helpful, though. I, even with an internal re revision, I, I don't know that it, it it is now that I'm I'm thinking about it because, again, with the dates, if, if you if, if you went like a whole year between a release, is that really? Do you really want to talk about all the development you did between all of those releases if you're not using Semver? You probably don't. Uh, and you don't care that people can't import between January 1st, 2020 and January 1st, 2021. Um, you, you just care about what's out there. And, and, and likely they're testing with, if, if someone is creating a module that imports from yours, they're testing with a, a version that they had in hand and, and they would probably anchor to that uh, versus just picking some arbitrary revision number. Uh, okay, Joe, I think you persuaded me. So the, the second part of the proposal, because um, I think we have one minute left, uh, to Kent, your point, uh, pruning a revision out of a history should not be done. Um, I, I think we were uh, discussing on the last call that there might be issues where um, some, or might be situations where some someone might do that. So we didn't say must not, uh, but we, we, we went with the second strongest should not be done for the reasons that um, list here. It would be very difficult if you, if you forced people to go back into different instances of the module to complete the lineage. You know, like uh, I suggested a link list type of following where you just have the one previous revision and you have to keep jumping. So the idea was simplicity. You have all of the revisions for the lineage that you want in a single module and, and you either resolve or you do not resolve dependencies there. And I know we're up against the top of the hour. Um, this was the last slide. I, th I think and just given we're out of time, I think you know let's uh, let's bring all this back to the to the working group list to kind of firm up as far as we've gotten on this call. Okay, I can do that. All right, I don't know. Chairs want to? Yeah. So as chair, um, right. did, did everyone sign the blue sheet um, on CodeMD? Please, if you haven't. 
Um, just looking at it, I see what uh, about twelve names. Is that correct? The number of people on the call. Yes, okay. that's consistent. Okay, good. Um, anything else? I uh, see. I we'll guess the chairs will um, send out meeting minutes, uh, draft minutes, and, and, and then ask for comments. Jason Stern's notes are real good. So Excellent. Go yes, thank you. Already. Yep. Thank you for note takers. Great. All. Great. Thanks, everyone, for all your help and participation. Okay. All right. See you guys. Yeah. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.